end of Mark's gospel. Correction. We are slowly approaching the end of Mark's gospel. We are looking actually at the last day of Jesus' life on earth in the gospel of Mark chapter 14. If you have a Bible and you want to turn there, I'll be there in just a minute. In the last two sermons, I kind of jumped ahead uh, to look at Peter's denial of Jesus after his arrest. And to see that, we had to jump to two or three different places. But today, I'm going to go back before Jesus' arrest and look at one of the darkest moments in his life when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Would you please stand as we read from the scripture this morning in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. They came to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I prayed. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> there is quite a bit here in this passage to talk about. So I'm going to look at this passage this week and again in two weeks. Because next Sunday, Justin Crone will be among us to present the Passover experience in our worship service together. And I, it'll be very enlightening and I think important for us to see this. Today, I'm going to cover three main points from this passage. First, this account gives evidence that the gospel events really happened. Second, this account is going to show us that the judgment and wrath of God are very real. And third, this account pictures the essence of the gospel. So first, let's look at how there's evidence in this passage that the gospel events really happen. <clears throat> this passage is showing us and describing how Jesus faced his own death. And it is very unique in the ancient world, in the ancient literature. Greece and Rome have many stories describing the deaths of prominent people and their heroes. They are cool, calm, collected when they face death. They are dispassionate even, Greeks and Romans, untroubled by their imminent deaths like Socrates was. And even in Jewish literature, we also find descriptions of how their leaders and heroes faced their deaths, but they weren't cool and dispassionate like the Greeks and Romans. As they faced it, as they praised God, as they're being sliced to ribbons by their enemies. We, we can see this in the apocryphal books of First and Second Maccabees, which describe Jewish warriors as they faced the Seleucid authorities. They were hot-blooded and fearless as they faced death. There's nothing in Ancient literature like how Jesus faced death. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knows. He knows he's about to die. And he opens his heart to God. 
and his disciples to talk about his struggles, his agonies, his fears about facing death. In his struggle, he even turns to God and asks if there's any way to get out of this, his mission. Nobody, listen to me, nobody in the ancient world would call their leader a hero who faced death with the struggles like Jesus did. Nobody. You don't see it. It's an embarrassment. Commentators and historians have said this for years. If you, if you are a leader in the early church making up stories about Jesus' life in order to advance your religion, you would never, ever include something that would hurt your credibility, like Jesus' struggles as he faced his own death in the Garden of Gethsemane. You wouldn't include it if you're trying to convince people this is our hero. Wouldn't happen. The only possible explanation for why this account is in the Gospels is that it actually happened. This is an eyewitness experience being related to us. A second thing we learn from this passage is that the judgment and wrath of God are very real. Listen to me. That's what you may not have heard, thought about this. That's what this passage is about. It's not really about sleeping. It's about the fact that the judgment and eternal wrath of God is real. (laughs) Listen to me. This is an extremely important passage to look at to understand Jesus and what he did. Up until now, in every gospel, Jesus has been in complete control of his situation. All of a sudden, in verse 33, he starts to fall apart. Up until now, nothing seems to have surprised him, shocked him, caught Jesus off balance, not his encounters with demons, not violent storms, not controversies, not plots to kill him, nothing. He's cool, calm, and collected, knows how to handle each thing. He always knows what's going on and how to respond. Nothing seems to shake him until now. Look at the words describing him in the garden. Mark 14, 33, he began to be deeply distressed. The word is ekthambatse in Greek, and it means to be absolutely astonished and shocked. I mean shocked. Something Jesus saw or realized stunned the eternal Son of God and sent him reeling. Next, the text says Jesus was troubled. Well, (laughs) that's too mild of a translation, actually. The Greek word means to be overcome with horror. Horror. At what he saw or experienced. I don't know if I don't know too many of us have experienced real horror. <laughs> I have. I hesitate to even share it. But uh, I never knew really was until I had this experience years and years ago. I, there was a time uh, I can relate to the feeling of horror when I was in seminary in Dallas, Texas. And I was working full-time, going to school, and I was on the highway going around Dallas, and I drove past a car accident that had just happened. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it. Where a woman, a mother, was beheaded, and her infant in the car seat was crushed. I still can't get it out of my head. I, I literally was horrified and sick for weeks. I, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't, I couldn't function. It was too awful. 
That's horror. But it's, it pales in comparison to what Jesus is seeing. Son of God was not surprised by much of anything, or shocked, until now. Whatever the Father was showing Jesus as he prayed caused him to experience a deep, terrible, awful horror. That's the word. Finally, Jesus says in Mark 14, 34, that he, his soul was, was deeply grieved to the point of death. What, what he's saying, his, he's so crushed with horror and shock that he feels like he's going to die on the spot. And this is what Luke, Luke adds to all this as Jesus was under this stress that he started sweating drops of blood. So horrible and shocking was what he was experiencing, feeling, and seeing. As he faces his death, Mark 14, 33 tells us that something he realizes causes Jesus to begin to fall apart, literally fall apart. He's on the ground, writhing. He's agonizing, struggling. To see Jesus struggle with his own death is not only unique in ancient history, it's almost unique in church history. You know, there are many accounts of Christian men and women, leaders and lay people who were martyred, killed for their faith in Jesus. They were burned alive, thrown to wild animals and torn apart. They were crucified. They were sawn in two. And all of them faced death more calmly than Jesus. Look at how Stephen died. We looked at last Sunday, in Acts 7, 54 to 60, looking up to heaven, his face radiant like an angel, it says, and seeing Jesus ready to greet him and forgiving those who are putting him to death. We could look at any number of martyrs. I, I love the story of Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, who faced his death in 167 AD. We have, we have his account. We have the account of it. Polycarp was, a, was brought before Caesar and given a choice to confess that either Caesar was Lord or Jesus was Lord. And if he swore allegiance to Caesar, he would be set free. Here's what he said. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my Savior? The proconsul said to him, I will burn you with fire if you will not change. Polycarp responded by saying, (laughs) you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour, and after a little while, it's extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why do you wait? Do what you will. And then the people gathered wood and burned Polycarp. When you look at how Jesus died, how he faced death here, actually, Jesus isn't saying, bring it on, bring on the nails and the thorns, the lash and the spear, bring it all on. Doesn't say that. Why have almost all of Jesus' followers died better than Jesus? Hmm. Why was Jesus struggling? Logically, listen to me, first thing. Logically, Jesus must have been facing something that Polycarp and other Christians weren't facing. Second, Jesus must have been experiencing something far worse than any kind of physical torment and death. Far worse. He's fallen apart. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be tortured. 
But this, this shook him to the core. Up to this point, nothing really shocked Jesus. He knew he was going to be rejected, tortured, killed. He predicted as much to his disciples several times. But now, verse 33, something he began to see and feel absolutely viscerally shocked and horrified the eternal Son of God. What? What was the Father showing him? Well, in Gethsemane, the Father wasn't showing him any new information, really, about what was happening. He was beginning to experience, though, the eternal reality of what he was going to do. It's one thing to know a raging fire is hot. It's another thing to experience the unbearable feeling of being in it. What was Jesus facing? What was he experiencing? Jesus began, the Father is showing Jesus a foretaste of what he was going to go through on the cross beyond physical at a deep, cosmic, spiritual, eternal level. And it horrified him. Actually, he refers to what the Father is showing him in his prayer. When he says in 1436, Father, Abba, Father, remove this cup from me. He said, I don't want the cup. I can see it and taste it. Please remove it. What was the cup? Well, all through the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, the cup was a symbol for the wrath of God raining down on human evil. Like, it's, it's really a metaphor for divine justice for, on sin. Poured out on sin and injustice. Like we, we see it, for instance, an example of Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel says to me, take this cup cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. His wrath. That's what the cup represents. So what was happening to Jesus? Well, I was reading one commentary in this passage and he puts it this way. I I think he's got it. He says, all his life, Jesus experienced the most wonderful, fulfilling life, intimacy with his heavenly father. We see it as baptism. The heavens are rent. And he hears the father say, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased, spirit comes upon him. See the Trinity functioning in this mutual love and esteem and glorifying each other. That's how he lived. And whenever he turned to the Father in prayer, heaven opened up and flooded his soul. He could sense the Father with him and giving him what he needed at the time. And that's how he was able to face what he was facing as he walked through life. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was absolutely stunned and shocked. Because when he turned to the Father in prayer one more time, Hell opened up instead. (laughs) All he had was the abyss, the chasm, the nothingness. Sin, you see, is turning away from God. And the, the, the just judgment for sin is complete exclusion from God. Finally. Exclusion from God, who is the source of all life and love. The abyss. The cup, you see, was the coming judgment Jesus would come on him for our sins on the cross. For our sins. He was getting a foretaste of what that felt like. The eternal judgment 
coming down on him. He became a curse. He became sin for us. And the father's just giving him a foretaste. We'll, tell, uh, we'll talk about why in two weeks as we look second look at this. It's very important. Jesus began here in the garden. To, he's on his face. I'm, I'm not kidding. This is, this is, he's falling apart. He sees it, experiences it, feels it. Hell's opened up. Our punishment for our sin is coming on him. And he began to experience the spiritual darkness, the eternal torment that awaited him as he goes to the cross. And he began to experience the spiritual, cosmic disintegration known as hell. Total exclusion from God forever. And when he began to experience it, it stunned him. He literally staggered. But at this point in the garden, it's it's just a foretaste of what he will actually experience. And uh, one author said about that, Oh, friends, if just the sight and taste of the eternal suffering moved the eternal Son of God to violent agony, What must the full experience have been? Some people among us don't like the idea of an angry, wrathful God. They believe in a peaceful, loving God. But listen, if you want a loving God, you have to have an angry, wrathful God. Loving people get angry at what is wrong, because they are loving. If you don't get mad at evil, you either don't care or you're too absorbed in yourself. God's not like that. He does care. (laughs) And he gets mad at evil. And he plans to judge it. We see this in Psalm 145. Love And justice. Verse 20, the Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. You can't have one without the other. It's not really love. Based on what Jesus uniquely experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can conclude, and I'm not kidding. If this doesn't convince you, I don't know what can. This unique testimony. We can conclude that the judgment and wrath of God are very, very real. Absolutely terrifying. Finally, uh, One more thing, what Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane actually pictures the essence of the gospel, the good news. But it's just a picture. After Jesus praying the third time, asking three times for the Father to remove the cup, he realized suddenly the foretaste was over and the time was up. And he got up, woke his disciples, and he said, the hour's come. Let's go. He's ready to drink the cup of God's wrath for the sins of the world. And in Mark 14, 41, when Jesus says, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners, he's not only describing the betrayal of Judas, he's also describing the great cosmic spiritual reversal there that is about to happen. When Jesus refers to himself here as the Son of Man, you probably know this already, we'll be talking about it a few more times before we finish Mark, 
When he refers to himself as the son of man, he's referring to this messianic godlike figure in Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel's vision concerning the end of time there, you see God giving the son of man an everlasting kingdom and makes him judge of all the earth, every nation. But here, Jesus says the son of man is being betrayed and handed over sinners to be judged and condemned. Something wrong here. Something wrong with this picture. This isn't right. Just the opposite should be happening. Sinners should be being handed over to the righteous king for judgment. Exactly. So when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man being handed over, he's pointing to the whole substance of the gospel. Here is the gospel's great reversal. Instead of sinners being handed over to him to be judged, he is being handed over to them to be judged. We're going to take change places. That's the gospel. The one who deserves all the glory instead gets condemnation and death. And the ones who deserve condemnation and death get glory instead. That's the gospel. Amazing grace. How can it be? (laughs) Sinners such as me set free. How? The gospel. He took my place. What do we learn from this today? Well, let's review a couple things. First, because of Jesus' unique testimony of honest struggle with what he was facing in death, it validates the gospel accounts. These are not, these are not made up stories, made up and try to convince people you ought to become a Christian. They are eyewitness accounts of what actually happened. Second, based on what Jesus experienced about the cup of God's wrath, it, as I said, validates that God's judgment and wrath are very real. Which, without Jesus, all of us would face terrifying, horrifying experience in God's presence. It was real enough to make the Son of God stagger, disorient, lie in his face, begging that it be passed. It wasn't. Third, we learn that what Jesus faced and experienced is the substance of the good news of the gospel. He has received, he has received the just penalty for our sins. He became our sinless substitute to receive the judgment of God for the sins we've committed. That's the gospel. Now, when we understand that, I think there are three things that follow that we really need to do. The first thing is we must believe in Jesus. He came for us to save us from that judgment that he faced for us. (laughs) When we believe in Jesus, God forgives us our sins and gives us the gift of eternal life. Listen to me. If you listen to Jesus, you do not want to die in your sins without Jesus as your Savior. You do not. (laughs) I can't tell you how many times Jesus warned people about this. Let me give you one. Very significantly, Jesus said three times to the religious leaders of his day, holy people, righteous people. He said this when they refused to believe in him as Messiah. In John 8, 24, he says, you will die in your sins unless... You believe in me. That he is the Messiah. 
There it is. But when we do believe in Jesus as Messiah, God forgives our sins and we pass out of judgment into life, John 5, 24. But not only must we believe in Jesus, second, we must deepen deepen our understanding of what Jesus experienced for us so we never, ever take that for granted or lose sight of it. It's huge. So Why? So that we can <laughs> grow in more and more in our love for him, our devotion to him, intimacy with him, and service to him, who gave it all for us. Third, obvious, we must tell others <laughs> about Jesus, how they can receive the gift of eternal life when they believe in him and avoid such an awful, horrifying, eternal judgment. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Jesus took our place, experienced the divine justice for the sin what we deserved. Thank you that even though Jesus was stunned and shaken at the torment he would face for us, He did it because of his love for you and for us so that we might live, be reconciled to you forever. We ask you, Father, to help us draw closer to you to experience the love that Jesus made possible for us through his suffering. Help us to meditate on these great truths this week, I pray in Jesus' name.